Hello, this is Dr. Gardner, and this is a brief tutorial on how to write oxidation numbers for uh, electrochemical reactions called redox reactions. We're going to be learning some basic rules for assigning oxidation numbers and determining how to start uh, using oxidation numbers in the following tutorials for writing half reactions and balancing chemical reactions. In this specific tutorial, we're going to focus though on determining a set of oxidation number rules and how to apply those to a specific set of molecules, atoms, ions, and keeping track of them. This will be useful because we will want to assign oxidation numbers whenever we look at a redox reaction to determine uh, what is being oxidized, what is being reduced, what is gaining electrons, and what is losing electrons. So that's what we're going to be looking at here. Uh, so the first thing you need to understand are some basic definitions about what a redox reaction is. Now a redox reaction occurs when both oxidation and reduction occurs. So if I consider the first half of this process, uh, if oxidation is occurring, we can define oxidation as the loss of electrons. Now this always occurs with something else gaining electrons. That will be a reduction process. So whatever is reduced is gaining electrons. These also both occur at the same time. They occur simultaneously simultaneously and we end up with having them come in pairs. So I first of all have to realize that something is going to be what we call an oxidizing agent. Now whatever is an oxidizing agent is causing something else to be oxidized and that means the oxidizing agent itself is reduced. So be careful because of the name inferring to what it is doing to the other chemical substance and not as what, what is happening to itself. So that means if I talk about a reducing agent, it is reducing something else. It is causing something else to gain electrons while the reducing agent itself is losing those electrons that are being oxidized. So be very careful when we use those terms oxidizing agent or reducing agent. It means that something else is involved with the other half of the electron transfer and the agent is actually going to be reduced if it's the oxidizing agent or oxidized if it's a reducing agent. So be very careful about that. We'll try to assign some of those in these tutorials so you get used to using that terminology. Okay, so realize that the number of electrons that we will be gained by uh, the oxidizing agent as it is uh, reduced will be the same as the number of electrons lost uh, by the reducing agent as uh, it is oxidized. So just realize that that is what is happening there. So be very cautious. So let's look at a few examples of this. First of all, remember oxidation was the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. So if we consider um, calcium metal reacting with oxygen gas to form calcium oxide, we can determine what's going on with the transfer of electrons if we start to think about what we're going to call oxidation numbers. Now oxidation numbers really is just a technique to do a little bit of uh, bookkeeping for keeping track of electrons that are being transferred in redox processes. Now sometimes we call the determination of oxidation numbers, also known as oxidation states, as really not the same as determining charges in most cases on our atoms. It's going to be different than charge, but it's going to basically keep track of where uh, the electrons are coming from and where they're going to when we look at a redox reaction. And so here if I consider calcium and oxygen, any element that's in its neutral elemental state, even if it's diatomic or some of, of a polyatomic element, as long as I'm talking about that element before it has transferred any electrons, we're going to assign those as an oxidation number of zeros. So we also realize if I have an atom that is not part of a chemical compound, not combined with other elements, then we would assign the oxidation state as a zero. Okay, So I have these neutral elements, they have no charge, their oxidation numbers are defining as zero, even though oxidation number can be different than charge. I, I do realize that all the oxidation numbers of all the atoms present in a molecule or ion or an element would add up to the charge. Okay, but it's not always identical to charge, so just be cautious with that. Now, if I look at the calcium here, uh, at the end of this process, I get an ionic compound, and the calcium actually forms, in this case, a 2 plus charge cation, and what has happened is it has lost two electrons. Now, remember we said that oxidation was the loss of electrons, so I would say that calcium was oxidized, but we would define it as the reducing agent because it causes oxygen in the atmosphere to be reduced. So oxygen, which is the oxidizing agent, is itself reduced, and it is now 
at a lower charge. So I could also say that the oxidation numbers in these cases, and I like to write oxidation numbers underneath the elements so I don't confuse it with charges because they're not always identical. So be cautious about that. So calcium had a zero oxidation number here and oxygen had a zero oxidation number here in the elemental forms. Uh, if I have a monoatomic ion, this is a case where the oxidation number happens to be the same as the charge. So if I have a single atom with a charge, well, the oxidation number happens to match that, but that's only going to be true under this type of circumstance. So I'd say the oxidation number is A plus 2 for the calcium. Now, it's not the same as the charge, so I showed the plus symbol first rather than after it. Uh, for the oxidation number for oxygen, it's a negative 2, so they'll be the same as the charge for monoatomic ions, but be cautious, like I said, they won't always be the same as the charge on a polyatomic ion. We'll have each atom assigned a specific oxidation number, and if I add them all up, it will add up to that overall charge. But here, it's a very simple scenario. So monoatomic ions have the same charge as... Uh, their oxidation numbers, but that's the only case where you can rely on that. Okay, uh, so realize since we have oxidation and reduction occurring simultaneously, we often refer to, refer to these as redox reactions. We must both have oxidation and reduction occurring at the same time. Now, one way you can often tell if you have a redox reaction is if you look and you see neutral elements on one side and a compound on the other. When you see elements forming a compound or compounds forming there are free elements. When you see that case where you have just free elements on one side but not the other of the reaction arrow, that indicates a redox reaction has occurred. Electrons have been transferred as we've either formed those compounds or had those compounds form their elements. So look for these free elements on one side or the other when we have redox reactions. Now there's a few memorization tools you can use to help remind yourself that um, we have oxidation and reduction processes. Uh, now, we don't always have to have oxygen present when we have something being oxidized and something being reduced, but it's maybe helpful to recognize that when oxygen does have to be present, it's a great oxidant, meaning it's an oxidizing agent that causes something else to oxidize. Uh, it's causing something else to oxidize because something else is losing electrons, why oxygen tends to gain them. So realize that oxygen, as it's reduced in charge, the oxygen is reduced. We end up usually with a 2 minus charge once we form oxide as it combines in ionic compounds and as it was reduced it oxidized something else but I don't have to have oxygen present in redox reactions so be very cautious about that I don't have to have oxygen present when oxidation is occurring to something else it just means when I say oxidation that something is losing electrons and when I say reduction that something is gaining electrons uh, one way you can remember this is the little mnemonic device uh, that is oil rig so if I remember oil rig well Oil, oxidation is the loss of electrons, is a useful way to remember the oxidation process. And rig, reduction is the gain of electrons, that's pretty useful. There's other mnemonic devices you can use. If you imagine a lion named Leo growling, I can say... Um, so if Leo the lion's growling and you get a grrr sound from the lion, we can say, well, Leo here... Leo the lion is growling, and so we can say, well, the loss of electrons is oxidation, the gain of electrons is reduction. So Leo Gur is a good mnemonic device that you'll run into. I like to use uh, oil rig because we'll find that when we talk about electrochemical batteries, uh, where the anode is, we have oxidation, and where the cathode is, we have reduction. And you'll notice alphabetically in the same or order as mnemonic not sorry the mnemonic device for oil rig but it's not in the same alphabetical order as Leo Gurr so I usually will use this one oil rig because it relates to electrochemical batteries now this this will be true when we're talking about electrochemical batteries discharging that anode is where that oxidation is occurring spontaneously uh, that cathode is where reduction is occurring spontaneously when, when discharging those batteries so it's a pretty useful mnemonic device in that sense uh, now if we want to summarize uh, some of our redox processes, let's maybe look at some chemical reaction examples. Uh, let's say that we have a zinc metal in an acidic solution. So I have zinc metal in this acidic solution. So I drop a piece of zinc metal, let's say, in a solution of acid here in this test tube. We see bubbles being produced because we have a redox reaction occurring where the protons from the acid are producing hydrogen gas and we end up with the zinc losing electrons to become the zinc cation and dissolving into solution. So we end up with having 
the oxidation state for the zinc to begin with being zero for the element when it's by itself without any other elements combined with it. Uh, the hydrogen cation, when we have a monoatomic ion, the oxidation number is the same as its charge, so it's a plus one here. Uh, we're producing uh, the zinc two cation and the zinc two cation if I have a monoatomic ion, the oxidation number will happen to be the same as its charge, so it's a plus two. And then when I have the neutral uh, hydrogen, we end up with any element when it's neutral by itself is zero. And so we can see basically what's happening here is I have two protons. So I have two of these here. So if I were to add those up, I get plus one plus one for a total of a plus two with all of the combined oxidation numbers for the multiple hydrogens. Uh, that's indicating that I had two electrons in this case that end up being gained as zinc loses two electrons. And so I could say that the zinc in this case uh, was being oxidized as it loses electrons and so that's my oxidation process and I can say the protons are being reduced it makes sense it's being reduced to a lower charge it's going from a plus one to zero it's being reduced here in the other half reaction and we're transferring in this case two electrons two electrons are transferred uh, in that reaction so I can say two electrons were lost in the oxidation half reaction and two electrons were gained in the reduction half reaction. Okay, so that's what I can look at. So I'm calling these half reactions because they're both half of the process for the redox process. One is the oxidation half, one is the reduction half. So we have those two oxidation numbers. So I can say all of these things about this. Oxidation and reduction are occurring uh, when you have something oxidizing, that's where a reactant is losing electrons, such as the zinc. We can also say that it's the reducing agent is causing something else to be reduced while the zinc is oxidized. So the zinc is oxidized. It's called the reducing agent, okay, in this case. And its oxidation number increases. That's what I look for in this redox reaction, okay? The oxidation number for zinc increased from this case zero to a plus two. Okay, in the reduction half reaction, the other reactant is gaining one or more electrons. Here, each hydrogen ion is gaining one electron. There's two of them, so that's where two electrons are being gained to produce the diatomic elemental hydrogen in the end. Okay, since I have the reduction process occurring as it gains electrons, then we can say it's oxidizing the other reagent, the zinc. So we say the the protons from the acid, the hydrogen ions, are the oxidizing agent oxidizing something else as itself is reduced. So be careful as you keep track of those. Sometimes students will find that a little bit confusing. Okay. Hydrogens oxidizing the zinc and then hydrogen ends up being reduced as it gains those electrons. It's taking electrons from the zinc. Okay, so realize when I have the reduction process, you're noticing whatever is being reduced has its oxidation oxidation number decreasing. Now that's going to be easy to remember, right? We're reducing the oxidation number. That's a reduction process, okay? The reduction process is as you're gaining electrons though, so be very cautious about keeping track of that. So that's everything that we need to know right now for looking at this redox process, uh, but we're going to have to learn some more methods for keeping track of oxidation numbers in more complex scenarios, so we'll come to that in a minute. Okay. So in summary, what we've been seeing is how to determine some simple oxidation numbers and where we'll use them is when we start to keep track of electrons being transferred. We'll keep track of the oxidation half of the reaction and the reduction half of the reaction and we can use those to help us balance chemical reactions. Okay. Now here in a redox reaction, not only are we balancing for mass, but we also need to balance for charge. So we'll find in redox reactions that often will be quite important that we're balancing for both. So make sure your charges are balanced. Just on our last example, we had seen that the charges on the zinc cations that were produced had to balance with the charges on the hydrogen protons uh, that were occurring as we ended up producing elemental hydrogen, we saw that the ch charges on both sides of the arrow were both plus two. Okay, so we were keeping track of charge balancing. Okay, so sometimes we might have to multiply the coefficient integer to make sure that the number of electrons gained is equal to the number of electrons lost when we look at half reactions. Okay, when I do combine two half reactions, they should add up to a balanced redox equation. And oftentimes, if you keep track of the number of electrons transferred, you know the ratio you need to multiply the coefficients with respect to the 
chemicals in the other half reaction. Okay, so let's consider a simple redox reaction where we have uh, copper metal uh, being placed. So let's say I take a copper wire, I place it in a solution that contains silver nitrate. Now what will happen is we end up with a redox process occurring because copper is higher in the metal activity series than the silver cation. And as we look at the copper being higher than the silver on the metal activity series list, we expect the higher metal on that list to be more likely to be oxidized. And if it's oxidized, it would lose electrons and any metal lower on the list is more likely to be reduced and will gain those electrons. Okay, remember oil rig, oxidation is the loss of electrons, reduction is the gain of electrons. Higher on the metal activity series list means that the metal is likely to be losing electrons. The metal lower on the list, if it's a cation, is more likely to be gaining electrons to be reduced. And that's exactly what's happening here. Neutral copper, since it's higher on the list, is likely to be oxidized to form a copper cation. In this case, it's forming the copper 2 cation. And then we have the silver cation that we begin with, which is lower on the list ends up gaining one electron to form neutral elemental silver. Okay, so if I look at my oxidation numbers here, I can think about copper since it's an element having an oxidation number of zero since it's not combined with any other elements. It's just element of copper, it doesn't have a charge, it's not an ion. Uh, if we look at silver at the end, again we have silver without a charge, it's neutral, it's not in a compound, so the oxidation number is a zero. We begin with silver with a plus one charge. We end up with copper uh, with a plus two charge here to balance out the two nitrates. And so the oxidation numbers for the monoatomic ions happen to be the same as their charge. Now many times oxidation numbers will not be the same as charge, which is why I've written that under the element symbol to remind myself of that and not writing it up where I would normally write charges. Okay, so if I'm looking at this, I can see how many electrons are transferred. Well, copper forming a higher oxidation number must be oxidized and it must be gaining, so it's going to gain, sorry, not gain, it's going to be losing, oxidation is the loss of electrons, it's losing two electrons. Now if I look at the silver, the silver is being reduced, its oxidation number is being reduced, so I'm remembering it's being reduced, and it must be gaining, and I look at the change in the oxidation numbers per atom. One silver atom, sorry, silver cation in this case, plus one, is forming one silver neutral elemental atom, so there's only one electron that was transferred here per silver atom going through this process. Since my two electrons lost by the oxidation, process and the one electron gained by the reduction process is not matched, this isn't a balanced chemical reaction. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to write the two half reactions. I'm going to ignore nitrate because the nitrate is identical on both sides, which is inferring that it's not changing an oxidation number. So I just need to focus on the copper and the silver. So I'm excluding nitrate right now. And whoops, we just need to move this down for a minute so the copper oxidation half reaction is showing copper is forming the copper 2 cation plus it is losing two electrons. So when I'm losing electrons, I should show them on the right hand of the arrow as free electrons. You notice that I'm charge balanced. I have a two plus and two minus for those two electrons. So in oxidation processes, show the electrons on the right. In reduction processes where we're gaining electrons, we show them like they're a reactant. We're gaining them, so I show them on the left hand side of the arrow. So I'm looking at my two half reactions here. We can see that copper, since it is uh, losing two electrons isn't balanced with one silver cation gaining one. So to balance that, we would need to, in this case, realize that the silver should be multiplied by two for its coefficient. So I go two, two, and two. So I end up with two silver cations. Each one of those is gaining one electron. So I went up to two electrons. Now they had two silver cations. I'm producing two silver cations. So now I, I know that to balance this reaction, I need to have a 2 here and a 2 here. So I just had to look at the ratio of the electrons transferred. And oftentimes that's all you need to do is multiply by the number of electrons that need to be transferred and change the coefficients with respect to the species that has its oxidation number that you need to balance for the number of electrons transferred. In this case, we could say that 
since copper is being oxidized, it's the reducing agent, and since silver is, is being reduced, it's the oxidizing agent. Okay, it's causing the copper to oxidize. The copper is causing the silver to be reduced. So those are the agents. So be cautious there. Okay. Now, let's look at some cases where we have uh, oxidation numbers we need to keep track of in greater detail. I'm going to teach you a few rules that you need to memorize for determining oxidation numbers. Okay. Uh, realize that uh, the oxidation numbers that we have are assigned to individual atoms, not groups of atoms. However, the oxidation numbers we assign, if we add them up, will add up to the overall zero charge on a neutral molecule or will add up to the overall charge on a polyatomic ion when we look at them. So that's important to recognize. So add up to whatever the charge is on that species if I determine the oxidation numbers for every single atom present. Now if I have a free element present without a charge, so I just have an elemental species, those oxidation numbers are all zero. So if I see sodium metal that's neutral, uh, beryllium that's neutral, if I see potassium metal that's neutral, lead metal that's neutral, those all are zero oxidation numbers. If I see other elements even if they exist as a molecular element such as diatomic hydrogen, diatomic oxygen, or if I have uh, for phosphorus present in a polyatomic molecule, well then they're still, since they're elemental species that are not bound to any other element, we still assign their oxidation number as a zero. However, if we have a monoatomic ion with a charge, monoatomic ion charges happen to be equal to the oxidation numbers that we are determining. So in the lithium cation, I would define the lithium, uh, char the oxidation number to be a plus one, it happens to be the same as the charge only for monoatomic ions. If I have the iron 3 cation, its, char its oxidation number or its oxidation state would be plus 3. If I have the iron 2 cation, its oxidation number or oxidation state would be a 2. Okay. If I have the oxide anion, well the oxide anion is a 2 minus, the oxidation number happens to be the same as its charge, it's a negative 2. Now be careful, I'm always writing down oxidation numbers in the homework with a negative before the number, not after it, since it isn't identical to charge all the time. So I don't want to write it like some of these charges with the negatives afterwards. I'm always going to put it before it. Okay. Now, let's learn some rules for different elements in different circumstances. First of all, let's consider oxygen. If I have elemental oxygen like we did here, we have an oxidation number of zero. If we had the oxide anion, we have an oxidation number of negative two. However, there are cases where you have peroxides. So if you have oxygen present in a peroxide, like in hydrogen peroxide, well, in that case, uh, you have... Uh, the peroxide ion, you can think about O2, 2 minus, uh, where the oxidation number is a negative 1. So I would have a negative 1 here, and since there's two of the oxygens present, there's a negative 1 for each one of them, so they add up to a total of a negative 2. So I would say that in that case, uh, that my oxidation number per oxygen atom was a negative 1, and they add up to the overall charge on the polyatomic ion. So that's what I'm looking at there. Now, uh, if I consider the oxidation number for fluorine, fluorine combined in any chemical compound, meaning it's combined with any other element other than itself, we consider the oxidation number for fluorine to be a negative 1. Okay, so these are some good rules to know. Uh, let's consider hydrogen next. If I have hydrogen present, well, if I have elemental hydrogen, such as we saw here, when, so there's no charge, it's just elemental hydrogen combined with itself, its oxidation number is zero. However, if I have hydrogen present in most compounds, I treat it as a plus one, such as when it's present with acids. Now, the only exception to that would be if I have a metal hydride, like calcium hydride. In metal hydrides, the hydride species, the hydride uh, anion, is a negative one. So I I, most of the time, since hydrates are quite reactive, I won't run into that one as frequently. So I usually will see hydrogen being a zero for its element. And most of the time when it's in a compound, it'll be plus one unless you see a metal first with the hydrogen listed after it, which indicates a hydride. Under those rare circumstances, you'll end up with a negative one for the oxidation number. So those are the common oxidation numbers when you're looking for hydrogen present in your species. Okay. Now, when you have alkali metals present in compounds, we expect the alkali metals should form plus one charged cations when they're in compounds. Well, the oxidation number we would always predict for alkali metals would be plus one. 
uh, for alkaline earth metals. In those cases, we predict the oxidation numbers would be plus two in compounds. And as I said before, if we end up with fluorine, we end up with an oxidation number of a negative one whenever we run into fluorine. Now, if I add up the oxidation numbers on every one of the atoms present in a chemical compound, uh, such as a molecule, or if I add up every one of the oxidation numbers in a polyatomic ion, the, all of those oxidation numbers of every atom present in that species should add up to whatever charge we have present. If it's a neutral molecule, all the oxidation numbers should add up to zero. If it's a polyatomic ion, all the oxidation numbers should add up to charge on the polyatomic ion. Okay, those are the general rules that we'll be looking at. Okay, so this will allow us to match up with all the charges we've been learning in the past at the beginning of the course with respect to uh, ionic compounds. We'll find the oxidation numbers will add up to the charges that you memorized. Okay, so let's consider a few compounds and assign some oxidation numbers to them. So first of all, let's consider elemental bromine. So elemental bromine, when I have bromine combined with itself and there's no charge present on this species, we predict that the oxidation number for bromine would be zero. So each bromine has an oxidation number, also known as an oxidation state, of zero. Now if I have a monoatomic cation, we would predict the oxidation number was a plus one. And so that's what we're seeing here. So bromine we predict to be zero for the neutral element, the potassium monoatomic Ion, we predict to be a plus one. Whenever there's a monoatomic ion, we predict the charge is the same as the oxidation number. Now, if I have a compound, I have to be careful and think about the compounds I have present. Now, lithium's an alkaline metal. We learned the oxidation number for alkaline metals should be plus one in compounds, and we learned that fluorine should be a negative one in ionic compounds, or present in any compound. We treat fluorine as a negative one for the oxidation number. Uh, if we look at carbon dioxide, we didn't have a rule for carbon. So I'm going to have to look at the oxygen for a second. If I think about the oxygen, well, we learned that oxygen, if it was a neutral element, was zero for the oxidation number. It's not a neutral element here. It's in a compound. It's combined with carbon. So it can't be zero. Uh, we also learned that it's usually a negative two unless it's a peroxide. This is carbon dioxide. It's not a peroxide, so it can't be a negative one. So it must be a negative two. So I have a negative two for the oxidation number for the oxygen. Since I have two of them, I'm going to take that negative two times two, which gives me a total here of a negative four. Now, since this is a neutral molecule, all the oxidation numbers should add up to the overall charge. So the overall charge is a zero here. Okay, so if I were to add up the oxidation numbers, I could say that the oxidation number for carbon is going to be ets plus the oxidation number of all the other oxygens is negative four. So if I solve for ets, we'd find that ets would have to be a positive four for the carbon. So oxygen's a negative two, carbon's a positive four. There's a negative two oxidation number per every oxygen, so that's how we're adding up to zero. Okay. Now, if I have a polyatomic ion, we're using similar rules. Instead of adding up to zero, though, we're adding up to the charge on the polyatomic ion, so everything should add up to the charge of a 2 minus. Now, again, it's not a peroxide. It's not the elemental oxygen, so it should be a negative 2 for the oxidation number for my oxygens in these cases. And so if I look at that, I have a negative 2 for the oxygen. There's four oxygens. So I'm going to multiply that by four, so I'm going to write the total for multiple atoms present underneath on a second line. And I'm going to say, well, that four times a negative 2 is going to give me a negative 8 for oxygen. I'm going to add that with sulfur's oxidation number. There's only one sulfur, so I'm going to have a 1 ets here. And I'm going to add that to the negative 8 present. And that should all add up to a negative 2. Okay, so if we think about what that adds up to, we can say then I can uh, add 8 to both sides to isolate my 1 ets. So my 1 ets is going to be equal to a negative 2 plus 8. Since I added 8 to both sides, I isolate the ets variable. And so that tells me that I should have an ets value of a positive 6 for sulfur. Okay. Now if I look at the following compound, I know that alkaline metals in compounds should be a plus 1. So I have sodium as a plus 1, and I have two sodiums. So I get a total for all the sodiums present of a plus, whoops, I'm thinking ahead. I had a plus one and I have two sodiums times that. I get a plus two overall. And I know that since this, small, this compound has zero for the overall oxidation number, that should all add up to zero. So I have a plus 
ets for oxygen. And so I realize ets must be equal to, actually it's a two ets, there's two oxygens, so it's a two ets. So a two ets should be equal to, if I subtract two from both sides of my equation, I get a negative two. And so ets would have to be equal to a negative two divided by two, so it's a negative one. So this is a case where I didn't have oxide, I had a peroxide. So this is sodium peroxide. Now I had a hint about that because I hadn't simplified the ratio to be one to one for the elements. We often will not do that if we have a polyatomic anion present. So this was the O2 2 minus anion, the peroxide ion. So we have to be careful. This is one of the cases where we did have a peroxide. So plus one for sodium and negative one for the oxygens. This is one of the exceptions when we have a peroxide. Okay. In the other oxygen-containing compounds, uh, they're usually a negative 2 for the oxidation number for the oxygen. Okay, let's consider if we have more than two elements present in my formula to determine the oxidation numbers. So let's say we're looking at the bicarbonate ion, also known as hydrogen carbonate. If I look at this, I have a rule for the oxidation numbers for the oxygens present. They're a negative 2 each, but I have three of those, right? So I have 3 times a negative 2, so this is a total of a negative 6. Okay, my hydrogens... In, unless it's part of an element or part of a hydride, a metal hydride, uh, we would consider it an oxidation number of a plus 1. Okay, so I have a negative 6, plus 1, and the oxidation number for carbon is going to be my ets value. So I'm going to have a plus ets for the oxidation number for that one carbon. So it's just a 1 ets because there's only one atom of carbon present in the formula. So I need to isolate the ets to solve for it. Now my Overall, my all my oxidation numbers should add up to the charge. Since it's a mono, since it's a polyatomic ion that has a charge of a one minus, they should add up to a minus one here. So I can go ahead and solve for ets by adding a positive six to both sides. Okay, that'll cancel the negative six on the other side, and I'm going to subtract a negative one from both sides. Okay, so in this case, I would have to add up to a plus. 4 overall. Okay, all my oxidation numbers uh, for to solve for ets. We end up with them adding up to everything. Now, if I, I can double check this, I can say, well, there's a plus 1 for the hydrogen. Uh, we just said it was a plus 4 for the carbon. We just said there was a negative 2 for each oxygen, but since there's 3 of them, we multiply by 3, so we get an overall negative 6 for the combined oxidation numbers for all three oxygens. So if I add plus 1, plus 4, minus 6, we add up to a negative 1 as my double check that I did everything right. So my oxidation number for carbon was a plus 4 in this case. Okay, so so far you're becoming masters at determining oxidation numbers in our compounds. Like I said, it's a really useful tool when we start looking at redox reactions in greater detail. Now let's look at a few other compounds that determine their oxidation numbers. What's the oxidation number for oxygen? If you'd like to pause the video and answer for yourself first and then double check to see my answer, feel free to do so. Uh, if I have elemental oxygen, even though it's diatomic, the oxidation number is just a zero. I'm writing oxidation numbers under the formula so we don't confuse them with the charges in any cases. Okay. Uh, here we have the hydrogen cation, a monoatomic a monoatomic cation like the hydrogen cation here happens to have an oxidation number that's the same as the charge, but just be careful about that because in polyatomic ions it's not as simple as that. We have the chromium-3 cation, it's a monoatomic cation, so it's the same as the charge, so the oxidation number, the oxidation state for chromium is a plus 3. If I have the chloride ion, uh, the charge for the monatomic ion is a negative 1, so the oxidation number or the oxidation state for chlorine is a negative 1. So those are fairly simple cases when we only had one type of atom present. Now let's consider compounds when we have multiple types of atoms present. Let's consider water. When I have water, I have a rule for hydrogen. Unless it's part of a metal hydride or elemental hydrogen, we would expect the oxidation number to be a plus 1. Now I have to be careful because there's two hydrogens. So I'm going to take plus 1 times 2. So my oxidation numbers for all of the hydrogens add up to a total of a plus 2. But I would still say my oxidation number for each individual hydrogen is just a plus 1. Okay, my oxidation number for oxygen uh, should be in this type of compound, since I don't have a peroxide, it should be a negative 2. So you see if you add up the plus 2 with the negative 2, we add up to the overall charge, and this is a neutral molecule, it should add up to 0 as my double check that I've done everything correctly. Okay, if I have 
iodine dioxide here, IO2, well, I know that oxygen should be a negative 2 since it's not a peroxide. And I have two of those, so times 2, that'll give me a total here of a negative 4 combined oxidation numbers for the two oxygens. And then I don't know what the oxidation number rules are for iodine, so I'm just going to put in a 1x for iodine. So I have 1x minus 4 is equal to the overall charge. Since we gave no charge, we're going to say that's a 0. So we can say that x is equal to, I'm going to add 4 to both sides to isolate x. So I end up being with x equal to a positive 4 in this case. Okay. If I have bromine heptafluoride, we can go ahead and determine the oxidation numbers. We didn't have a rule for bromine. We did have a rule for fluorine. So when fluorine is in a compound, we're going to have a negative 1 oxidation number. Since there are 7 fluorines, that's going to be times 7. So my overall oxidation number total for all the fluorines is a negative 7 overall, once I take minus 1 times 7. I have 1 bromine. I'm going to put that in as ets. Since there's no charge for this neutral molecule, our overall summation of our oxidation numbers should be the same as that neutral charge of 0. And so we'd say that ets must be, if I add 7 to both sides to isolate ets, must be a positive 7. Okay, that would be my oxidation number. Now, if I'm looking at potassium uh, periodate, well, potassium periodate here, uh, we have some oxidation number rules that can help us figure everything out. We have a plus 1 uh, for alkali metals like potassium. We know oxygen should be a negative 2. We don't know iodine. It should be an S. Now, I have to be careful because there's four options, so I need to take this negative 2 times 4. Okay, so I can say the total oxidation number for all the options is going to be negative 2 times 4 is a negative 8. And then I add up all my oxidation numbers. So I have a plus 1 for potassium. I have a, a plus x, whatever x is for iodine. And we have a negative 8 for oxygen. Uh, the overall compound has a 0 overall charge as written. So it all adds up to 0. So we solve for x. To solve for x, I'm going to add 8 to both sides. So I get a positive 8. And then I also need to isolate the x by subtracting 1 from both sides. So I subtract 1 from both sides. So we end up with x having a value of a positive 7 in uh, periodate for the iodine's oxidation number. Now sometimes this is a little easier. You'll find if you break up a uh, ionic compound into its ions, we could have said, well, we have the potassium ion present, and we have the periodate ion present, which is IO4 uh, negative. Okay, if I look at those, I could have determined the oxidation numbers separately. I know potassium would have to be the plus one because I have a plus one charge for a monoatomic ion. Uh, the periodate ion, I could have determined that there was a negative two for the options with a negative eight total. And I had an S for the iodate or sorry, the iodine oxidation number, that should have all added up to a negative 1. Okay, so if I added 8 to both sides, we'd end up again getting a positive 7. So whatever you find is easier. You can either, either determine all three elements simultaneously when you do the calculation, or you can break the ions up and do them separately, so, such as what you saw I did here. Okay, when I took the negative 1 plus 8 to get my positive 7 for iodine's oxidation number. Okay, so those are two different techniques we can use. Let's look at a few other scenarios. Let's look at uh, diiodine heptaoxide. Okay, if we look at that, we can end up with determining oxidation numbers here. I had rules for oxygen, so a negative 2 for oxygen, but there's 7 oxygen, so my total for all the oxygens is going to be a negative 14. Now, since there's two iodines, I can't put just ets down. I have to put a 2 ets because I'm determining the oxidation number for each of the iodines, and there were two adding up to the total. Okay, so I have a 2 ets, minus 14 adds up to whatever my charge is. Since there was no charge so shown, we are assuming the charge is 0. Okay, so here I could say then that my 2 ets, if I add 14 to both sides, is equal to a positive 14. Okay, and, and then to, to solve for my ets, I can divide both sides by 2. So I can divide this side by 2. I can divide this side by 2. So I'm going to say that s is going to be equal to a positive 7 again. Okay. So my iodine has an oxidation number of a plus 7 in this case. Now if I'm looking at um, the following po polyatomic ion, we can go ahead and look at permanganate. As we're looking at the 
manganate ion, we can anion, we can go ahead and realize that we don't have a rule for the oxidation number for uh, manganese. In fact, we know it's a transition metal that can have a variety of oxidation states or oxidation numbers. So we're going to hit, go ahead and go to oxygen again. It's our trusty friend here. We're treating since it's not part of our peroxide. The oxidation number of oxygen in this polyatomic ion is a negative two times four, since there's four oxygens, we're going to get a total here of a negative eight. And so I know since I just have one manganese, I just put a one at, so one at uh, minus eight is going to add up to the oxidation number of a minus one. So we know ets, if we add eight to both sides, we're going to get uh, ets is equal to a negative one plus eight. Okay, so in this case, our manganese has an oxidation number of a plus seven in that case. Okay, so pretty simple to determine those. So if I just add up my oxidation numbers for everything, I have a negative eight total for the four oxygens, uh, plus seven adds up to a negative one, so it should add up to my overall charge as my double check. Now, if I have the following complex ion, we call this a complex ion, it's, it has the it has iron present that we're trying to determine the oxidation number, and it has chlorine. Uh, there are six chlorines. We're going to treat the oxidation number uh, for the chlorine as a negative one in this case, and there are six chlorines, so negative one times six is going to add up to a total of a negative six. And I have one iron, so it's going to be a one ets. Now, I knew chlorine was a negative one here because when it's combined with the iron, it's going to be present as chloride. So that's how I knew it was a negative one. So I have six of those, so negative six adds up to the overall charge on this complex ion of a negative three. Okay, so I, if I isolate ets, then we'll know that ets is equal to a negative three, and I'm going to add six to both sides. So I'm going to add a plus six. And so we end up with getting a total here of a positive three. So we have the iron three cation present in this complex ion. So a plus three minus a total of negative six gives me the negative three for the overall charge. So that's my double check. I make sure all the oxidation numbers add up to the overall charge on the species. Okay, let's consider the dihydrogen phosphate. So now we have a polyatomic ion with three atoms and a charge to keep track of. Uh, if we consider this case, we know all the oxidation numbers all the oxidation numbers should add up to the overall charge of a negative one. So that helps me out. Now I know hydrogen in this case is going to be treated as a plus one for the oxidation number because it's not a hydride and it's not elemental hydrogen. We know oxygen should be a negative two. And there's four hydrogens, so I'm going to take that times four to get the total. So I get a total of a negative eight for all of the oxygens. And then I have a uh, plus ets for whatever the oxidation number is for phosphorus. So, okay, so if I rewrite this, I can say uh, plus one for the oxidation number for hydrogen. Well, wait a minute, I had two hydrogens, so I'm going to need to multiply by two, right, because of the two hydrogens here. So I had a total of a, a plus two for all the hydrogens. So I really need to have a plus two plus ets minus eight adds up to the overall charge of a negative one. So to determine what ets is, my one ets is going to be equal to, I'm going to add eight to both sides. So I have a negative one plus eight. And a negative two. I subtract two from both sides. And so if we add that all up, we end up with getting a total of a plus five. So ets must be a plus five for my oxidation number for phosphorus is a plus five here. I can double check everything. So I get plus two plus five minus eight adds up to a negative one, right? Because I end up with that plus five here for the oxidation number for phosphorus. This combined is a plus seven minus eight gives me the negative one for the charge overall here. So that's my double check that I determine the oxidation numbers correctly here. Uh, if I consider uh, the dichromate ion, the dichromate ion has two uh, chromiums present. We'd like to determine the oxidation numbers on the chromiums. Uh, the oxygen, since it's not part of a peroxide and it's not elemental oxygen, is going to be a negative two and there's seven of them. So we know we're going to get an overall total of a negative 14. Now my oxidation number for chromium is going to be ets, but I have two ets's. I got this 14 because I had the seven oxygens, right? So I have two ets's here, so I'm going to say I have two ets. Minus 14 adds up to my overall charge of a minus two. 
So to solve for x, we can find, well, that 2 x, if I add 14 to both sides, 2 x is going to be equal to a positive 14 minus 2 is going to add up to a 12. Okay, so I know that x here would have to be equal to dividing both sides by 2, 12 divided by 2, so I end up with x equaling a positive 6. Okay, and if I put that in as my 2 x, uh, 2 times a positive 6 gives me a positive 12 for my suggestion number for both chromines combined. Minus 14 adds up to the overall charge of a negative 2 to double check my work. Okay, so we've just learned how to determine all these oxidation numbers. You want to be able to determine these oxidation numbers so we can look at what's going on with transferring electrons. So let's look at a case where this is true. Uh, so if we consider oxidation and reduction, maybe a better way to define this is we consider that when oxidation is occurring, the oxidation number will be increasing for that element during the reaction. So in this case, let's look for which oxidation number is increasing. Well, carbon in... Uh, Methane here has an oxidation number of a negative 4 going to a positive 4 in carbon dioxide since the oxidation number is increasing. The carbon is being oxidized. We can say during oxidation we're losing electrons. So carbon loses electrons in this oxidation process. Okay, if we can also define reduction as occurring when an atom's oxidation state decreases during a chemical reaction. So we can say that oxygen's oxidation state of zero, since it decreases to a negative two when it's reduced, when you say oxygen's being reduced, it's gaining electrons when it's being reduced. So ox oxygen's reduced as it's oxidation numbers reduced okay so when you say carbon then is being oxidized it's the reducing agent oxygen is being reduced it is the oxidizing agent in this case so when can we look at a combustion reaction like methane burning in oxygen uh, to form carbon dioxide and water vapor not only is it a combustion reaction it's a redox reaction because we have changing oxidation numbers okay so this is a case where it's quite helpful to recognize changing oxidation numbers so there's no question that there's a redox reaction occurring Okay, so we're going to use these skills in the future, so I hope you found this tutorial and this practice of determining oxidation numbers uh, pretty useful. If you have more questions, please contact me. Have a great day, everybody.